Hello, I'm Paul Bradshaw. And I'm Lauren Gray. Welcome to Viral History, the only weekly show on the internet brought to you from Home Pierre Pont. Coming up on this week's show, I sit down with historian and writer Nicholas Stargardt. First up, we've got some news for you. The oldest human bones ever found are shaking our very understanding of the human story. The extraordinary discovery of Homo sapiens fossils in a Moroccan mine have been dated as 300,000 years old. This poses a challenge to the idea that the earliest humans evolved in East Africa some 100,000 years later. And the discovery of a 15th century songbook in Brussels has been likened to finding 12 new drawings by Rubens. The Leuven Chansonnier contains 50 polyphonic songs and is incredibly rare. Twelve of the songs contained in the tiny book are completely new. Next up, Nicholas Stargard is Professor of History at Oxford University, writing widely on the history of modern Germany. And recently Viral History spoke with him about the rise of Nazism. In what ways did the radicalisation of the German state impact Nazi racial ideology? It's not obvious to either the regime or the population at first what that will be. So the Nazis come to power on a wave of terror, but it's a terror waged against the left. It's a terror against the traditional socialist and communist parties and the trade unions. So it looks like fascist terror in Italy. People think that they're re-seeing what had happened in Italy ten years earlier. And you know, the first generation of concentration camps, the prisoners are overwhelmingly from these working class neighbourhoods. And Jews are persecuted, but in rather small numbers in the first wave. And it isn't obvious until the late 30s that it's going to shift focus. So by 1934, 18 months into the regime, Maybe 100,000 people have gone through the, me the machine of, the, of Nazi terror, but they've been spat out again, and there are only about you know, fewer than 5,000 concentration camp prisoners left, and they think that they might even close them down. Um, and Himmler then has to you know, reinvent himself and find another reason why he's needed. So he focuses on asocials. He focuses then on the work shy, um, repeat, offenders, so people who we would think of as recidivists, which of course is often not people who've committed murder, but petty criminals. You know, remember the Californian three strikes and you're out, and the poor first person who was going to be sent off to life imprisonment in California pinched a pizza on a beach. Um, and the Nazis find a similar problem, that they're arresting rather nondescript, um, sort of helpless people, not people who would be obvious enemies of the state. But that's the buy-in, and that gradually is extended as they extend this elastic word, asocial, to embrace Jews, Jehovah's Witnesses, um, Freemasons, a series of small minorities, and of course Sinti and Roma, what they talk about as gypsies, whom they've already identified as potential enemies. But these are the beginnings of, if you like, the racial state of this being a terror which has got a racial direction. And it's very important because it allows them to let photojournalists into the concentration camps like Dachau to put in the illustrated weekly press photographs of a tough but fair regime and photo images of the prisoners themselves to make them look like they're paedophiles and communists. And that this is a kind of South American, you know, Southern American states chain gang sort of regime, tough but fair, and that most national comrades are on the right side of this. And that's different from 33, where it's very similar to a regime which has come through a civil war, except it's a civil war that it's unleashing. By the mid-30s, they're trying to persuade most Germans that they actually belong to the racial majority. And from then on, terror is really directed mainly against minorities within Germany. And that's, that's what's very different about Nazi terror and Soviet terror, where the Stalin regime really imagines that it's fighting the majority of society, and it's got a big project of social transformation, and it assumes that you know, the most majority of the population is a peasantry, is against them, 
and indeed even large sections of working class in the Soviet Union would be against them. And so they implement terror far more ruthlessly and they also expect far less consent. The Nazis start banking on consent and being willing to tolerate small amounts of dissent and criticism and treat it as loyal criticism, whereas the Soviet state wouldn't have done. And I think that, you know, the more we study this, the more we realize the two regimes are quite different and that totalitarianism doesn't actually describe either of them. So you don't believe that Germany under Hitler or the Soviet Union under Stalin were in fact totalitarian states? No, they're t even in the Second World War, when the Germans start using terror against at particular moments, um, they tend to do it in a way which is exemplary. So it's more like an early modern state which decides to execute people in public in order to send a message, in order to tell people, you know, it's another propaganda tool or another educative tool in order, in order to make an example of one person. So, you know, at the beginning of the war, they're executing Polish forced laborers and shaming German women who've been their lovers. And the German women are having their heads shaved, which will be done across liberated Europe by resistance movements in 44 and 45, but the Germans start doing it. And later in the war, um, there's a wave of public criticism after the firebombing of Hamburg, and at a certain point in the autumn, Himmler says we had to make an example of a small number of people for saying what we know everybody was saying in order to make it clear that this is the limits, you know, you don't go here, that this sort of talk is defeatist. And we aren't going to get everybody who talks like this, and we don't want to, but we do want to send a message. And it's very clear that there are particular moments, even at the very end of the war, when the Wehrmacht is worried about mass desertion in the last months of the war, they want to start arresting the families and relatives of deserters and holding them hostage and threatening them with punishment. And of all institutions, it's the Gestapo and the SS which say no. And they say no because they say these people are probably good Nazis. We can't start persecuting our own. Whereas, of course, all through occupied Europe, they, um, they inflicted collective reprisals. They held people collectively to account. They did all of those things. But they, they didn't ever get to the point of doing it in Germany proper. And you can see the calculation that these are our own people and on the whole we can persuade them to go along with us. Here's Marguerite with On This Day. Today in 1536, Henry VIII's daughters were declared illegitimate on his orders to allow the children of his latest wife Jane Seymour to inherit. Jane died giving birth to her son Edward after a caesarean without anaesthetic. Though he survived to be king, Edward VI died at 15, leaving the throne to Mary and Elizabeth in turn. Well, that is all from us for this week. Feel free to hit the subscribe button, follow Viral History on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram, like this video and tune in next week. And remember, what's past is prologue. See you in seven days. And viral and... <sighs> That show, what's it called again? <laughs> I love it when you improvise. <laughs> Next up, Nicholas Stargard is Professor of History at Oxford University, writing widely on the history of modern Germany. And viral history had to talk... <laughs> but, for, oh. <laughs> <laughs> but first up, we have some news for you. <laughs> <laughs>